So for the lecture today, it's going to be very short. We are, so when you look at the uh, syllabus, you will see that it says block scattering. And we are actually just coming back around and covering one thing we skipped when we were doing optics. So this is section 4.6, x-ray diffraction. It was in your reading list, but we never lectured on it. You never had a homework question on it. We essentially skipped it. And um, it, that was the plan from the beginning. And um, I want you to delay it until now, because I think uh, um, this uh, particular context of diffraction, it's relevant for what we are covering now. And it wasn't really all that relevant for the optics that we are covering. So it's a different arrangement of diffraction. And um, I will tell you that, so I took my physics 4C in community college, Cerritos College. And um, I didn't learn about this until I was teaching physics 7C at Berkeley, because I guess it doesn't always get covered. <laughs> um, so at least this won't be one of those classes. So um, this is the situation that it's being described. It's a x-ray diffraction. And um, I guess, what do you know about x-rays? Like, like you know something about x-ray, right? right? From your just general science and technology knowledge. Like uh, if someone asked you, um, tell, me, um, tell me one thing you know about x-ray, what would you tell me, Jason? It's an electromagnetic wave, but there's a lot of things that are electromagnetic wave. That's not X visible light is electromagnetic wave, but it's not X-ray. What um, distinguishes X-ray from all the other things you know? When would you ever see X-ray, or not? See when would you ever hear the word X-ray outside of this classroom? Scans, right? Dentist office, doctor's office. What do they do with the X-rays? Yeah, look at your bones. Take a, take a picture inside your body. And the way, the reason they can do that is because x-ray goes through most material, right? So that's the number one thing you have to understand for this x-ray diffraction. You are looking at um, very highly energetic photon. And um, I guess one of the properties photon gains as it has more energy is it, uh, most materials become transparent to these high energy photons. So when you look at this x-ray diffraction, I don't think your textbook has a picture of it. It has a picture of the result of the diffraction. What you kind of have to imagine is this is the um, picture of, this is like a film that you are looking at. It exposed the film that, you, film that has been exposed to x-ray that you are looking at. And the way they gathered this, this picture was they could have done it different ways. It could have been, um, uh, meter, you could have x-ray source here, material here, it went through. And, but I'm pretty sure for some, a picture like this, it'll be done by reflection. So you have some material sitting here, for example. X-ray comes in at some angle, bounces off, and this is the um, picture that they get from that uh, kind of arrangement. So this diagram is probably less confusing than the way I'm just explaining it. But the reason I wanted to start by describing the property of x-ray is because this diagram leaves out a lot of things. So what it's showing is a crystal lattice, or two-dimensional version of it. Imagine each of these are atom, like, um, I don't know. Imagine each of these are, I don't know, carbon atom. So all these dots represent the carbon atoms. They are in some arrangement. Um, normally, it would have been three-dimensional arrangement, but for the purpose of this class, we are going to say, all right, uh, we, let's deal with two dimensions. And they are drawing only two x-ray rays. But I want you to imagine that um, the entire sample is being illuminated by many different rays. And it's showing these nearby, nearest, lay, um, nearest neighbor layers. But really what you have to imagine is there's a scattering going on here, 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 here. And all those dots that you saw earlier is the result of constructive interference from all those different layers. And that's why they're calling it x-ray diffraction. Because in some sense, it's like a diffraction grading that we did talk about. But the difference is that the geometric arrangement is different. So the formula that you would derive for the uh, constructive interference condition is different. For the regular diffraction grading, like this one, it was like the double slit interference, right? 
it's just transmission, you look at the two parallel arrays and you get the path length difference that way. Here, um, this is the geometric arrangement you are looking at. So, you know, looking at the geometric arrangement and you figure out, all right, um, so parallel arrays in phase, so starting here and here, so parallel, okay, so up to here, um, they are the same length, so same path length up to here. And so now with the x-rays, so this rays is now technical in the material, but you don't worry about it, you forget about it. For at the x-ray range, the index of refraction for the material is practically one. So there you don't worry about different, like changing index of refraction as you go into the material. Um, so, all right, um, that means this ray is going through this additional length here. And um, on the reflected side, you get the same picture. It's, it's the mirror image. From here to, well, I'm gonna draw it my way. Here, <laughs> from here to here, it's the same length. So when you look at something that's arriving at this point, then the additional path length you have is this path length here. So you can see the geometry, and does the geometry kind of make sense as it's labeled? So this is the plane of the crystal you are looking at. This is the angle theta you are measuring. Go through the geometry, well, this is also theta. So that means this path length difference must be the d, meaning d, uh, d distance between the layers. And uh, so that's this hypotenuse here times sine theta gives you this path length difference. Okay. And you have two of those. So the, the total path length difference is 2d sine theta. Yeah. Once this is geometric arrangement makes sense, then the rest is the same thing you've known before. For constructive interference, for constructive interference, you need to have the condition where I guess I can talk about the path length difference. The path length difference has to be equal to some integer number of wavelength. Right? We just uh, looked at the path length difference. So that's a 2D sine theta. So, um, so the condition for uh, constructive interest, I, I guess I'll just write it that way. 2D sine theta is equal to N lambda. And we call this Brock scattering. It's a scattering of, it's a scattering of um, highly penetrating particle. So in this context, it's x-ray. But actually, once you're dealing with the nuclear physics, people will do Brock scattering experiments with neutrons because neutrons are also highly penetrating into material, neutral, um, so, um, so, um, so that, this is for constructive interference, and since it's a kind of diffraction pattern, you don't worry about destructive interference, it's destructively interfering almost everywhere. Now, this is a highly simplified picture. If you read through the book back when we were covering chapter four, you might have seen that. Um, and you know, because when you, um, when you look at uh, this picture here, it's like uh, there's a lot of dots there. <laughs> um, and it's uh, kind of to say that this applies to that entire picture is very, um, it feels like we are oversimplifying something here. And I will just leave you with this. Um, the whole field is called X-ray crystallography. And in fact, this picture is describing how someone is analyzing a, a protein, crystal of a protein, by using X-ray. If, um, if you've heard of, how many here know about uh, something called the advanced light source at Lawrence Berkeley Lab? It, um, what they do is they have an, what you could call X-ray laser. They, have, they produce a highly coherent X-ray uh, light that can be used for experiments like this. Uh, it's a, um, a lot of material science people work there. Uh, you get some beam time, time at the, uh, at the what you, well, time at the synchrotron. Synchrotron? That doesn't sound right. Maybe it's a synchrotron. Well, time at the, the uh, synchrotron, uh, 
yeah, yeah. Side time at the synchrotron and um, uh, use the highly coherent X ray there to do something like this. Um, but so, but in X ray crystallography, that picture, so when you look at, sorry, I keep going back. From, so this is the work of X ray crystallographer. Um, starting from this picture that you would uh, see, you have to somehow infer back what was the crystal structure that produced this. And I am told this is more art than science, that there's no easy one-to-one -one mapping, that sometimes you just guess a model, what the crystal structure might be, put it into a model, and if you get the same thing, then all right, that might be a correct guess. If not, then you keep guessing. Um, this is common in research level work where the, it's a, called the inverse problem. And I will just uh, show you some um, aspect of that, um, illustrate that aspect of complication. I think your textbook has some drawings here, but three-dimensional things are hard to draw and understand from the drawing. So I was uh, Google search, well, searching through the Ulfran demonstrations project, and somebody made uh, this thing that I think will illustrate the kind of complications you have to think about. Um, so yeah, so I searched through Ulfran demonstrations project, um, Brock. This is the, I think, one that kind of illustrates it. I downloaded it somewhere down here. Um, let's see, there it is. Maybe, wait, that's not it. Wrong thing. Um, yeah, especially wrong thing. That's not even CDF. Um, maybe the other ways. Oh, ah, there it is. Um, so it's not re really doing any calculation. Um, it's just using a facility in Mathematica for 3D plots to do this plot. I can take this, grab it, turn it around. It's so when you actually move it around that you get a sense for the three-dimensional nature of this, right? So this is, I think this is called a simple cubic lattice. Um, there's, uh, so this uh, falls into the uh, domain of solid state physics or condensed matter physics. That's the area that I know least about. So I'm just gonna say simple cubic and we'll just leave it there. <laughs> um, and so for the um, drawing that you saw, drawing that you saw in the textbook uh, for this uh, simplified two-dimensional Brock scattering picture, this is what you can kind of imagine. Um, so let me turn this until I get a similar picture. Something like this maybe. All right, so this is the plane you are looking at. So that's the incident light reflected coming, going out there. And this would be the crystal plane that um, on the two-dimensional picture you weren't seeing at all. And the D would be the distance between these layers or something like that. And in this one crystal, at least in this uh, simulation, there are 99, no, I think it's like 27, 27 different possibilities. You can pick th these different um, parameters correspond to picking different crystal plane. So let me, I, I'm not gonna do all 27, let me just pick this and just turn it around. Uh, uh, I'll try to turn it to the similar picture orientation as what's in the textbook. So. So this is the kind of, oh, yeah. This is the side view of your crystal plane. And I don't know what other, um, I'm, I don't know what the exact distance would be. So that's the way, so it's three dimensional. <laughs> so when you look at a single diffraction pattern like what's here, uh, you have to kind of separate out, okay, which one belongs to what, and um, yeah, so that, that's the field of physics, or, or sub-field of physics I know nothing about. Um, but you should at least know what Brock scattering is. And you will kind of see, it, if you have ever have a question that um, is referring to this, you'll kind of, um, you know, you'll have a hint, uh, especially for this class, like on a homework or exam, if something involves bracket scattering. I guess one biggest hint is that you'll be dealing with the X-rays or in quantum mechanics, neutrons, or something that penetrates into material. And you will be looking at, um, you'll be asked about something about like a crystal structure, crystal lattice, distance. And really for this class, the most we can ask you about is, you know, something like this. Uh, some simplified picture. We are not asking any about like a separation between these neighbors, 
in the same plane, we are really asking about the, what is the separation between the two crystal planes. So D here. Um, so that's it. Uh, it's a fairly simple topic. We skipped it entirely. Um, now that we have enough context to where this matters, now I bring it up.